Good morning and welcome to the Thursday morning service. Um, I'm glad you're here today and I'm glad you're watching online. Um, if you would with me, let's stand and sing. We are singing I'll Fly Away, page 554. if you'd like. And we can't fly away without Jesus. Have to have Jesus in order to fly away. We're on page 510. Jesus is all the world to me.
suffering. seated. 1 Corinthians, it could be in the 11th chapter, and starting at verse 23, says this, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Then each and every week we come on Thursdays and Sundays and we partake of the Lord's Supper and we remember very easily, it seems, the fact that when we take the bread, we're taking Jesus' body. And when we take the blood, when we take the juice, we're taking his blood. And we remember Jesus hanging on the cross, dying for our sins, taking on the sins of the world. We remember the resurrection because that's the power that brings the forgiveness of our sins and the gift of eternal life. But it's that last verse that we never want to overlook. In verse 26, I read it again. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We proclaim that he's coming again. We know that he's coming again. We have faith. We know it beyond a shadow of a doubt. And so this morning as we come around the Lord's table and we partake of the bread and the juice, it is very appropriate to remember Christ's crucifixion, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And we live to pass on and proclaim that Jesus will come again. And we proclaim that death until he does. And so God, we come to you this morning and we thank you for what we're celebrating right now in this service. We thank you that we can celebrate each and every week that you came, you lived a human life, being both fully God and fully man. You went through a lot of the same temptations that we go through, so we have a Savior who we can depend upon, who knows what we go through in day-to-day -day life. But God, we have a Savior that died and willingly took up the sins of humankind, past, present, and future, upon that cross, Upon a sinless life, he took it upon himself. And God, we knew, he knew that entire time that he was going to have to do that up on that cross and take on the sins of the world to be separated from his father for a short time. But God, we praise you this morning that it didn't end there, that that's not the end of the story. We praise you, God, that the story continues because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that we can come here this morning proclaiming that we can have forgiveness of sins because of what Jesus did for us. God, we continue to proclaim this death, this burial, and this resurrection to anyone who would hear it. Because we know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that you are coming back. God, we love you and we praise you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.
Good morning, church. I threw Chad a little bit of a curveball. If you look at your agenda, if you will, it says the scripture is from Mark, but it isn't. It's from Romans. So I'll be reading from Romans chapter 12. And because I love the New Living Translation, all the scripture this morning is going to be from New Living Translation. Romans 12, 1 through 13 says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and custom of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect because of the privilege and authority God has given me. I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God's given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you so much for this glorious day. We thank you for the gift that you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and rose again. And Father, we just pray that you continue to be with us. Help us to just blot out all of the noise of this world and remain focused on you. And Father, I just ask that you increase each of our faiths, that you give us the will, the strength, and the courage to boldly go out and serve others so that we might shine a light for you. <clears throat> if there was going to be a title for this sermon, I wanted it to be to serve or to be served. And the subtitle would be, Who Wants to Be Weird? <clears throat> How many of you would agree with me that human beings are inherently self-centered, pleasure-seeking, and a little on the lazy side? <laughs> I think we're direct shipped right to our parents at birth, hardwired to enjoy being waited on, pampered, and provided for. We could test the theory if we wanted to by all caravanning to Volusia Mall after church today, seeking out a hundred random men and women and asking them to choose from washing and waxing a stranger's car for free or having a stranger wash and wax their car for free. It'd be a pretty safe bet that the overwhelming majority of people would choose a nice, clean car without having to get up off of their recliner. I believe it's also fair to say that willfully serving others is an unnatural thing as human beings. And by the world's standard, if you joyfully serve other people, it's just plain weird. And believe me, people recognize weird. If you enjoy the one waiting on pampering and providing for folks, especially strangers, I would lovingly and very admirably place you respectfully in the category 
of being weird. But not to worry. Jesus loves weird people. He loves everyone. But those who love him by being obedient and working to live their lives honoring him are particularly special and blessed. You know, whenever I started a new job, and unfortunately there were a few new jobs for me, I'd always ask my supervisor or the owner what his or her expectations were for me. Perhaps you've done the same. What was the most important thing that I needed to accomplish? You know, while walking through the temple that he had previously cleared of the people that were buying and selling sacrificial animals, Jesus was approached by the leading priests, the teachers of religious law and the elders, and they began to challenge his authority. When one of the teachers of religious law asked Jesus which of the commandments was most important, he replied in Mark chapter 12, the most important commandment is this, listen, O Israel, The Lord our God is the one and only Lord, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. So Jesus told us those are the most important commandments. Now, when I read this, there's a line in here that has two words, love your neighbor, love and neighbor. And those are the ones where Satan gets in my head and says, well, you're supposed to be in love with everybody. When Jesus says loving your neighbor is just as important as loving God, we should really try to understand what he means, right? So what does Jesus mean when he says love? Second John or excuse me, yeah, Second John in uh, chapter 1, verse 6 says, love means doing what God has commanded us, and he has commanded us to love one another, just as you heard from the beginning. And everybody here is familiar with the love verse in 1 Corinthians, but we'll go over it again. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud. It does not demand its own way. It is not rude. It is not irritable. And it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. It, it really helps me to think being in love is a feeling. And it is an emotion. While loving someone is an action, okay? So if loving my neighbor means serving my neighbor, the next question is, well, who's my neighbor? But that's the easy part. Your neighbor is everyone that isn't you. The love your neighbor as yourself part takes effort, it takes sacrifice, serving rather than being served. Is anybody else in here as relieved as I am to know that we don't have to be in love with our neighbor to love them. An expert in religious law asked Jesus what he should do to inherit eternal life to test him. And Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, the parable is not up on the screen, but at the end of the parable, Jesus asked the man, now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? And the man replied, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. So showing mercy to the man that was robbed by the bandits cost the Samaritan time, effort, money, and even some risk to his own well-being. It was work. Was Jesus telling this expert in religious law that inheriting internal life requires work? But I, I thought our salvation was not based on works. Ephesians 2.8 says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done, so none of us can boast about it. 
Our salvation isn't based on works. And most of us tend to forget the very next verse in Ephesians chapter 2. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Good things like loving our neighbors. Showing mercy, spending time, exerting effort, and taking risks to serve others is loving your neighbor. And it is also evidence of your love for God. But it's still pretty hard to love some people, isn't it? I'm sure if we gave everybody three minutes to come up and talk about something that happened in their lives with a person, there's not one that would not have a testimony about someone who was really hard to love. We aren't automatically released from our natural human tendencies, our fears, and our desires when we come up out of the baptismal water. We have to take up our cross and follow Jesus. It's intentional, and it isn't easy. Jesus never told us that it would be easy. In fact, he told us just the opposite. In Mark chapter 10, verse 27, it says, Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible, but not with God. Everything is possible with God. In 1 Peter chapter 4, it says, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. So, I love people by serving them, and I don't do this to be saved. I do it because I am saved. Mark chapter 9 says, after they arrived at Capernaum, and Dot tells me that's how it's pronounced, even though there's not an I in the word. Capernaum, right? Capernaum? After they arrived at Capernaum and settled in a house, Jesus asked his disciples, what were you discussing out on the road? But they didn't answer because they had been arguing about which of them was the greatest. He sat down, called the 12 disciples over to him and said, whoever wants to be first must take last place and be the servant of everyone else. And you can tell a tree by the fruit that it produces, right? Matthew chapter 5 says, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. But in the very next chapter of Matthew, it talks about the importance of righteous motivation to do good deeds. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 through 3 says, Watch out! Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven when you give to someone in need. Don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they've received all the reward that they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. When I read those two things, it's very easy to try to, to get a little confused. And what helps me is to realize that if you are going out and serving someone because you want to show God that you love him, you don't have to worry about people seeing it. They will see it. If you go out to serve people and in your mind you're thinking, I need to do this where people see, then you might want to hit your knees and pray about it a little bit more. You know, the Bible points out many times that Jesus' followers are different from what the world accepts and expects. The Bible also explains what Jesus' followers should remember about why we should be noticeably different. In the 10th chapter of Mark, it says, So Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. 
But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. First Peter chapter 2, verse 10 through 12 says, Once you had no identity as people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. In Hebrews chapter 13, it says, for this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home yet to come. Therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice to praise God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. And don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. First John, First John chapter 2, verse 15 says, Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything that we see and pride in our achievements and our possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away, along with everything the people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. Who here has heard of the name Friedrich Nietzsche? Friedrich Nietzsche was an atheist German philosopher, and Nietzsche absolutely abhorred Christians and Christianity. But I think two of Nietzsche's quotes are worth repeating here today because they hit pretty close to home. When Nietzsche was asked what he thought was the problem with Christianity, this is what he said. What's wrong with Christianity is that it refrains from doing all those things that Christ commanded should be done. And the next thing he said was, They'd, they would have to sing better songs for me to learn to have faith in their Redeemer. But the one that really hits is, and his disciples would have to look more redeemed. So people watch, they pay attention, and Satan wants people to trip up. Satan wants for people to look at a Christian and say, wow, what a hypocrite. What an intolerant person. So we don't have to do much to be seen in this world. We just, we need to be different. And the kind of different we need to be needs to be something that reflects Jesus. Let's do something a little bit different here. Please, if everybody will, close your eyes and keep them closed. I'm promise, I promise I'm not going to do anything up here that's worth seeing, okay? Fight the urge to fall asleep. But I want you all to imagine, I mean, really picture in your mind that you are Simon Peter after the roller coaster ride of witnessing Jesus' murder, finding the empty tomb, meeting and hiding from the Jewish leaders with the other disciples who are your friends, and then experiencing the risen Lord fill you with the Holy Spirit. You now sit across from Jesus on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. After an unsuccessful day of fishing, it's dark outside, and the fish sizzling and cooking on the fire in front of both of you is from yet another miracle performed by this man, your friend, the God that you love more than you ever thought possible, And he looks into your eyes and says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you reply. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs. 
After a pause where the only sounds are that of the water lapping the shore and the fish cooking over the fire, Jesus looks at you once again and says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you say. You know I love you. And Jesus says, then take care of my sheep. After an even longer and somewhat uncomfortable pause, Jesus turns back to you, leans closer, and asks, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Feeling hurt that Jesus doesn't seem to believe or understand how much you love him, you say, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And with that, Jesus places his hand on your shoulder, looks at you with an expression of love that pierces your heart, and he says, then feed my sheep. You know, folks, you could open your eyes. Those of you still awake, you could open your eyes. The older I get, the more aware I become of how simple and direct the Bible is about how we know for certain that we're saved. Has anybody ever asked themselves that question? Am I truly saved? John chapter 3 says, He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. So I ask myself, am I more interested in pleasing God and looking forward to hearing Him say, Well done, my good and faithful servant, than I am about the fleeting and empty pleasures the world offers? Am I more Christ-like today than I was yesterday? I didn't bring my Bible, but it is a large print New Living Translation Bible. And in this Bible, it begins each of the 39 Old Testament books and each of the 27 New Testament books by providing me the author, the place, the date, the content, and the theme of the book that I'm about to read. Because I like things uncomplicated and direct, I find myself trying to distill the information that I want and the information that I need down to the ever-popular and always beneficial short and sweet variety. Now, anyone who really knows me or has spent any time talking with me understands that while this is how I like to take in information, it isn't always how I share information. I tend to build people verbal clocks rather than tell them what time it is. That's pretty weird too, huh? Anyway, if you took all of the pages of my notes for this morning's message and you sent them to the good people of Reader's Digest and you asked them to abridge everything down to the most concise version possible, you would get the second and third sentences on the theme for 1 Corinthians as found in my large print New Living Translation Bible. And this is what you would read. It is not enough to say that we are Christians. Our living should demonstrate our beliefs. Otherwise, we bring dishonor upon Christ and his people. And I'll close this morning by sharing with you a couple of my favorite bumper sticker theologies. The first one really caught my attention, and it goes like this. Would the people that you work or socialize with be surprised to find out that you are a Christian. And the next one is, you may be the only Bible someone gets to read today. Let's pray. Father God, you are an awesome God. And you have left your word here with us and your spirit in us so that we may fully understand what it means to be obedient to you, how that makes you feel. Reaching out to others, Lord, and to share this precious gift that you have given us, this gift that as human beings is impossible for us to really explain fully. And we just ask for your strength in us. We ask for a boldness that surprises us when we have the opportunity to share you with others. We pray that what we say and what we do continues hour by hour and day by day to be closer to what Jesus Christ did. And we ask, Father, that you 
bless this church and these people with increased faith, protection from Satan's lies, and the ability to be able to feel your presence. And among all of this, Lord, may your kingdom grow and there not be a soul left that needed to hear the gospel that hasn't heard it yet. In Jesus' name, amen. Join with me for an invitation hymn, page 513, Oh How He Loves You and Me. quick things for you this morning um, we have our traditional service next Thursday is going to be a fifth Thursday so when we do that we have a singspiration so uh, be prepared we'll have all the hymnals and you can come ready to sing all your favorite songs just stump the pianist week so uh, it'll be a it'll be a fun time to just uh, singing singing our hearts out next week and in two weeks is the first Thursday of the month which is always pace setters the question might be where are you going to eat my answer is, I have no idea. <laughs> because to, to Bob's greatest fear, they have now shut down the Golden Corral across the street. <laughs> he's, he's still hurting. A little, a little tear has been shed here. But, um, so I really don't know. It, but we have two weeks to figure it out, so we'll announce it when we figure out what the plan is to the church. And so you can know where we're going to do. We, we will do pace setters, I'm assuming. I just don't know where yet. So. Um, so there's that coming up in two weeks. Also, this coming, um, not this weekend, but next weekend is the Community Brew and Food Fest over at the City Center. And uh, Chad was, and he was announcing this the last couple of weeks, and I kind of reiterate uh, what he was saying about this. We are going to be involved in the Business Expo on Saturday and Sunday. We need large quantities of people to come and help and share Jesus. That's the simple, that's the simplicity of what we're going to be doing is sharing Jesus. Yes, we'll be passing out cups of uh, root beer I think throughout the weekend uh, with these nice little Port Orange Christian Church uh, bright orange koozies that'll be just flying around the whole city center and everybody will be uh, doing that so that'll be fun but the reason we're out there is very simple as well how are people to know about Jesus unless we go and share so we're going out into the community to talk about Jesus with people so we hope that you'll be involved in that uh, we're not there necessarily to promote beer drinking, but we are there to promote Jesus. And so we hope that you'll help come and help be a part of that. Uh, also, pre-filled Easter eggs is coming up. Easter egg hunt's coming up on April the 8th. And Ellie always does a fantastic job. There'll be, there'll be like a little mini worship service in here before the Easter egg hunt. We'll be presenting Jesus again to three, 400 people, however many people are going to come that day. This is what we've had over the last couple of years. Uh, even through COVID, we've had that many people showing up to do the Easter egg hunt. So that's going to be awesome. We'd love you to help uh, with that. The best thing you can do to help is bring those pre-filled Easter eggs in, and uh, we'll get those all set up. We were uh, about a 1,000 shy, you said. 
And since we made that announcement, some people have really stepped up to the plate, <laughs> so that's good. But we encourage you to do that as well. So we have plenty to go around. It's not about the Easter eggs per se, but it's about our putting our best feet forward, getting people in, and presenting Jesus to them. And then that next day is Easter Sunday. We are having a sunrise service. It is going to be at the Riverwalk Park. It's kind of right next door to where we would normally do it at the Riverside Pavilion. It'll be outside. It's going to be at 7 o'clock in the morning, and it is going to be multi-church. So there's going to be a lot of churches involved in this. If you do plan on coming, bring a chair with you because the seating will be a little limited. So come, and we'll be a part of that. If it rains, there is no plan B. <laughs> if it rains, stay home. But uh, otherwise, we're praying for good weather and that we'll have a great sunrise service and then come back here and have our uh, Resurrection Day service here at the church at our normal time of 1030. So that's about it for our announcements this morning. We're going to close in prayer, and then we're going to sing our closing chorus today. God, we love you, and we thank you for everything you've done in our lives, and we thank you for Ron and for him coming and sharing today. We know you delivered the message to him that he has delivered to us. And God, we take this moment to, uh, even though they're going to be with us a few more weeks, we want to take this moment to pray over Ron and Dot uh, as they get ready for this move. You've called them to, to move up to Daresville, Georgia, God. And we, so we thank you that you have put this move uh, on their heart, and we know that you have got great things in store for them in the future and wherever they happen to minister. And so, God, we just pray over them, pray over this whole move. And we pray over Port Orange Christian Church as we now search for uh, one more person who will step up to the plate to become an elder alongside of Spock Henson. And we look forward to what you have in store for that. And so, God, today we pray that you continue to be with us now as we leave this place and we go out into the world to share your message as we continue building real faith in our own life to be able to pass it on to those around us. God, we love you. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for saving us. We thank you for giving us the way to salvation. And we just pray that that message will continue to go out to those that need to hear it. God, there is countless, countless lives just right around this church that are going to hell right now because they don't know the message. Help us get that message out to them. God, we love you and we praise you and we pray you keep us safe until we can come back together and worship you again. And it's in Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen.